Our fourth lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, and I'll be sharing with you verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Would you please pray with me? Oh God, we do thank you for your holy and living word. We thank you that your word is inspired not just in the writing, but again now in the hearing. And so, God, we ask with confidence that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, speak into our lives. Speak into our hearts and lives, Lord. Speak clearly and give us, Lord, the faith to respond, to not just be hearers of your word, but doers as well. And we pray for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the invitation tonight is to come and see what the Lord has done. To come and see what God has done by seeing who Jesus is, why He has come, and what that means for our lives. And our focus tonight is on this word, Emmanuel, that the Scripture tells us means God with us. So to get at who Jesus is, why he came, and what that means for our lives, we're going to step through each of those three words, God with us. First of all, what does it mean that Jesus is God? And then secondly, when God comes in Jesus, he comes and he says he is not just by us or for us or just above us, but he says that he is with us. And we'll see by that word with that he is communicating to us that Jesus is also human. He is truly human. And then finally, we're going to look at us, that word us. And this may seem obvious, but it needs to be said. That is that this us includes, well, um, us. (laughs) He is with us now, still here today. So we're going to start then uh, with what does it mean that Jesus is God? Uh, There's this, this time Uh, It's described in the Gospel of Luke, when after Jesus' resurrection, he gathers his followers and he opens their minds. He opens their minds to understand the Scriptures. And, And specifically what he's showing them, he's opening their minds to see how it is that he is the fulfillment of the promises of God from the Old Testament. He has fulfilled those promises and Jesus enables them, opens the eyes of their hearts and their minds to see that he is the fulfillment. Now, for Matthew, clearly one of the most meaningful fulfillments that Jesus, how he fulfills the Old Testament promises, is how Matthew sees that Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah 7, where God promises, he promises that this child will come and he will be Emmanuel, God, with us, right? But you see, um, the Jewish folks, they had had that prophecy for hundreds of years before the coming of Jesus. And the thing is, they, they didn't really expect that it would be fulfilled literally. They thought that it would be more figurative and symbolic. In other words, that there would be a leader who would come, and through that leader's work, God would figuratively be known. The result of this leader's work would enable them to know that God was with them. But it would be a figurative fulfillment. So what Matthew is showing us here is that this promise, this promise is far greater than anyone had imagined. That God wouldn't just come in some indirect, figurative way. That God, in fact, would come directly in Jesus. He would come personally in Jesus. Jesus is truly, fully God. Now, I know, I know 
that there are some, and maybe even some in this room right now, who, who would say, um, you know what, Jeremy, um, good try, but no. That's just too much to believe. Maybe in Jesus' day, that would be really easy for people to believe that Jesus was God, but not today, not in the age of reason. That just doesn't seem credible to me. There are some who will say that, but here's what I'd like you to consider. Here's what I'd like you to consider, that Matthew was a Jew, and there was nobody on the planet at this time who was less likely to believe that a human being could be God than a Jewish person. As a matter of fact, uh, Pastor Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, everything in the Hebrew worldview militated against the idea that a human being could be God. Jews would not even pronounce the name Yahweh nor spell it, meaning, meaning that they believed that God was so holy, was so other than themselves, that there, there was the world, there, there were people, and then there was God. And God was so holy that you couldn't speak His name. You couldn't even write His name. God was so holy. He goes on and he says, and yet, Jesus Christ, by his life, by his claims, and by his resurrection, convinced his closest Jewish followers that he was not just a prophet telling them how to find God, but God himself come to find us. You see, friends, the human soul cries out for God. Our souls yearn for God, to know God, to see God, to touch God. We long for the brokenness of our world to be made right. We long for the brokenness in us to be healed. And that heart cry of all of humanity is represented, is is encapsulated in this cry in the prophet Isaiah, where Isaiah, he cries out to God and he says, Oh God, rend the heavens and come down. Oh God, would 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 you not stay far removed from us? Would you not be distant from us, God? But would you come and would you do something, God? Would you move in this world? And God speaks into that cry of our hearts. And He says, and He says, into the emptiness, into the void, into the darkness and brokenness, He says, I'm coming. He says, I'm coming. There's a child who's coming who will be known as Emmanuel, God with us. Because... In Him I will save. In Him I will come near to you. In Him I will satisfy the longings of your life, of your soul. In Him I will bring the work of the new creation. And friends, listen, because Jesus is God, we can know that hope is real. That hope is real. That God has rent the heavens and He has come down. That there is a God in the universe who is good. And He comes to us. And He is responsive to us. And He wants to work in our lives. The fact that Jesus is God means that hope is real. And that God's promises, they aren't just true. They are better than we ever imagined. And if He fulfills this promise, this most astonishing and greatest of the promises, if He fulfills this one, what promise will God not fulfill in our lives? If He would do this, What in our lives would we face? What circumstance, what situation would be beyond His care, beyond the care of the God who would not stay far removed from us, who would not stand at a distance, but who came, who came in Jesus. Jesus is truly God. And because of that, hope is real. Hope is real. Secondly now, because Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, we know that love is, is real. We know that love is real. You know, of all the words God could have used to describe the coming of His Son when He would come in Jesus, all the words He could use to give meaning, to give purpose to that, to help us understand that, He uses this word with. He doesn't say it's going to be God by you, by your side. He doesn't say it's going to be God over you. It says, He says God with us. He doesn't just come and make an appearance. He doesn't just come and and stand at a distance. He comes close. Listen, He comes as close as possible. And this is what I'm trying to say to you is that Jesus is not only fully God, Jesus is fully human. He comes close. The Bible tells us in Philippians 2 that Jesus, though, uh, though God 
having equality with God, being of, of the same nature as God, that he emptied himself of his divine privilege. And he took on the form of a servant. That is, he took on human likeness. And he became obedient. He humbled himself in obedience. Obedience to the plan of salvation. Obedience even to the point of death on a cross. Jesus came into this world fully human, fully God, and he would know what it would be to be vulnerable. He would know hunger and thirst. He would know betrayal. He would know unjust suffering and even death. And what the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews is that that's the way it had to be in order for us to be saved. This now is quoting from Hebrews where, where we read, He had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. See, there was no other way. We had turned away from God. We had sinned and betrayed God. We had built up a debt of sin that we could not repay short of being destroyed in the judgment of God. And yet God came in Jesus he came in Jesus and He took the weight of His own justice on us. Please, see this. That only we humans owed the debt, but only God could pay it. And so Jesus, the One who saves, He comes and He is fully God and He is fully man and so He is fully capable of bringing us to salvation. The Scriptures tell us by the grace of God, that is by this amazing movement of God, by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for everyone, bringing many sons and daughters to glory. And here's the question then. Why? Why would he do such a thing? Why would he do this? And there can only be one answer. Because he was not compelled. He could not be forced. It was not because he had to. It was because of love. That's it. It was because of love. This is what 1 John 4.10 tells us. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, the truth is, the truth is that every human being longs for love. Longs for a love that will last. And I know that there are those who will say that there is no God, that there is no God, and they will say that there is nothing beyond this material world. There is nothing transcendent. There is nothing beyond what we can see and touch. There is nothing beyond this world. And so they will say that love is just a chemical response. Love is a survival advantage that's just programmed into our, de our genes. But there is something inside of us that tells us that's not true. Something inside of us that tells us that there is such a thing as love and it transcends this reality. And that love is God and that is the good news of Christmas. Ellsworth Callis says, Christmas announces of all things that it's a friendly universe because the power at the center of the universe is a loving God who sends His Son into the world to embrace its lonely heart. Christmas means, the fact that Jesus is Emmanuel means that love is real. Now, finally then, because Jesus is Emmanuel, He is God with us, we know that He is truly present. His presence is real. You know, listen, um, when God says that He has come in Jesus, He is God with us, we must not imagine that He was only speaking of the people who were physically present in the day of Jesus. When Jesus walked this earth, we must not think that that's who He was talking about, just them. It includes us. See, here's the thing. The Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel itself, is framed by this reality of God with us. It begins, the Gospel begins by identifying Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. And it ends with this promise of Jesus in Matthew 28, 20. And surely I am with you always. You see, Jesus has made this promise to His followers to be with us, to be with us now, to be with us always. And I want to ask you tonight to consider, to think through with me what that means. What is that like? What is that experience like? What is it like to know the presence of Christ in the Spirit in our lives? What does that actually mean? Why does it matter? <laughs> There's this beautiful piece of Scripture. Psalm 16. 
It talks about being in the presence of the Lord. It talks about how, how in the presence of the Lord, He leads us into the path of life. He shows us what life is. And, and in God's presence, we know the fullness of joy and eternal pleasures at His right hand. And that Scripture is fulfilled in Jesus. In Him, we can know true assurance. Why? Because the Spirit gives testimony, gives witness to our spirit that we are God's children. That's who we are. Because the Holy Spirit sheds the love of Christ abroad in our hearts so that we can comprehend, so that we can, we can see how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And we have in Christ this great assurance that His grace is really sufficient for each day, for each situation of this life. And we have this assurance, not just for this life, but for the next. That we have in Christ an eternal inheritance that is kept safe for us by Him. And so the Apostle Paul, who listened, he faced death daily. He proclaimed the Gospel, and for it he faced death daily. And he says in Romans 14.8, If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. He knows. This is a man who knows that he is standing each day in the presence of Jesus. And so the last question then is, how can we have such confidence? How can we have this confidence in the presence of Christ as Paul did, as Matthew did? How can we have that? And I will tell you what the chief obstacle is. The chief obstacle is that after all that God has done to come to us, after all that He has done to be with us, after all He has done to save us, we imagine that it would be a small thing to come to Him. And we offer Him little pieces and little parts of our lives when He has given His all for us. And we offer Him little commitments and little promises when He is all in for us. Friends, we want the presence of God in our lives. We want to experience Him in His love, but we want to do it on our own terms. I want to tell you, Jesus, when and how and to what extent I can be yours. But how? How could we tell the God who has come all the way to us? How could we tell Him that we won't go all the way for Him? Listen, I believe tonight that God wants you to know, to know the extent of His love for you in Jesus. I believe that tonight He wants you to, to encounter His love. I do. And I believe that He wants you to give your life to Him and to know His presence in this life and to know your assurance for the next. But here's the thing about that love. This is a love that claims us. This is a love that changes us. And so we all have to decide. Is this the night that I surrender to the One whose name is love? Is this the night that I lay down arms before Him? Is this the night that I say yes, not just partly, but You, Lord, are the whole to me? Is this the night that we see He is the pearl of great price? He is the treasure that is worth everything. And we come to Him. Friends, I pray that You would accept Jesus Christ, the light of the world tonight, not just in part, but in whole. And, and in just a few minutes, we're going to be sharing the light of Christ with each other. And I want to invite you to see this. When you receive that light of Christ, to see it as a sign of what's happening in your inner life, to see it as a sign of what's happening in your heart and in your soul, that you are receiving Jesus. Not, not a little tiny flame that can be manipulated, that you could snuff out, but that you are receiving the God who is a consuming fire. That you are giving your all to the One who gave His all to you. May it be so in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Oh God, we, we don't have the right words. We don't have the right words to say thank You for what You have done. For the great love that You have lavished upon us that we might be called Your children. But Lord, we come before you and we say we surrender we say Lord this is no longer a negotiation this is a full surrender we are yours not the part but the whole we are yours in Jesus name amen